Father, we praise you and we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together this morning. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here. We are here, Father, because you have touched our lives. You have blessed us, Father. You have enabled us to either tune in or to visit here in, in person. And God, we pray that you would just help us to hear what you would have for us this day. Help me to share what you'd have me to share. Help us each to be sensitive to your spirit this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was uh, praying about these things, I just had some thoughts as I was reading. And um, we live in a pretty selfish, me-first society, don't we? Um, you don't have to go too far to see that. And sometimes it rolls over into our relationship with God. And by that, I'll, I'll explain that as we go along in the message here. But during the Old Testament times, we read in the Word of the many sacrifices that, the, uh, that God required for the children of Israel and the people. For their sins, for the priests, and for various occasions or transgressions that had taken place in the uh, camp. And I've often said, man, I wouldn't have wanted to live in that time when they were continually offering up those sacrifices. The, uh, just a horrible thing. I mean, from our perspective, and you know, I know we're in, a, in, a, in an age today where people are somewhat softer and more offended by those things, but... One thing, or one time during Solomon's reign, there was a staggering often made, offering made on one occasion, and it's in 1 Kings chapter 8, 62 and 3, and I couldn't even imagine this. It says, Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord, and Solomon offered to the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated to the house of the Lord. I couldn't even imagine that kind of a sacrifice that had taken place amongst the children of Israel at that time. I wouldn't have wanted to be a part of that. You know, and even when you read um, from Genesis on, when they first instituted the offerings in Exodus, when they built the temple and the altar of, and the sacrificial altar at the beginning, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you had to grow up to be a, a less sensitive to, I guess. A number of years ago, probably 30 years ago, um, we had this computer system at work, and um, it was for maintenance type thing. It was fairly new, and there was this representative from the company who would come out and periodically see how things were going and to, to keep us energized on the program, right? I didn't care for the program, but you know, I didn't have a choice in the matter. And uh, he was a, a very fo social guy. He was an ex-football player, he said. I think he had a ring, so maybe so. Or he could have bought it, but anyway. Um, but he'd tell us about some of the companies that he would visit that had this, this uh, program, and they were, uh, he was doing the same thing to them, stopping by, seeing if they had any questions, and, and so on and so forth. And so one of the companies that he was talking about, or at least one of them, it was a place where they would uh, butcher critters, animals, whatever they may have been. And um, the person who dispatched those animals, they only had to work four hours a day doing that, and they got paid for a full day because of the psychological impact that had on them. I mean, for killing those critters, for the, the four hours or five hours, whatever it was, how difficult that might have been. And I couldn't imagine, just as you read about here in Solomon's day, how they did that. We, I guess, maybe in those days that I mentioned, you had to grow up in that environment. You had to be used to those things to a degree. And um, I'm glad we're not that way today. And I'm glad for Christ that we don't have to continue with those sacrifices. But the Bible tells us that the blood of bulls and goats had if it had been if it had been adequate christ would never have had to shed his blood to do that adequate job would he if that was acceptable but it wasn't there was a better idea a better plan that god had for main, mankind it is the spirit of man that needs to be cleansed right you and i have not really arrived until we have entered into that marvelous sacrifice that christ has offered recognizing his authority and absolute forgiveness and a cleansing from sin in our lives. And we have experienced that, many of us have. And it is our spirit that has been made alert by the word of God, and we can rest in the finished salvation that Christ has, for, has given to us, fully forgiven. And there is a peace in that, isn't there? 
to know that those things. And in Numbers chapter 19, it gives us the laws of purification. And we're not going to read the whole chapter there, but just verse 2, it says, This is a requirement of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. And that's out of the NIV. And so at that particular time, this was something that they had to do continually. As you read through this chapter, they not only had the Day of Atonement that you find in Leviticus, but they also had to do the things that were outlined in this chapter for the forgiveness of sins, for purification, for whatever those problems were. Sin in our lives is a fact which many people seem to neglect today. Christian people get cleaned up for church and we clean up, but yet the world is still on us. It, is still, it still affects us. But unless we've been cleaned spiritually to God, it still smells because we're spiritually dirty, aren't we? And sometimes we walk into a service with the world on us and we think that we're all good because we came to church, but it's more than that. It is more than just something that we do to um, check a box for Sunday. We are to desire to come into his presence, desire to meet with him, desire to be changed, to be cleansed, whatever the case may be in our lives. How many have been looking at things they shouldn't have looked at this week? They come with dirty eyes. How many have been listening to gossip or other things during the week? They've been hearing filthy things that they shouldn't have heard. They come with dirty ears. How many dirty hands because we've been doing things that we shouldn't have been doing over the past week? How many have dirty feet because we've been going places that we shouldn't have gone over the last week? We think that coming to church makes everything all right. Well, it's not all right. That's the reason that Christ said in the upper room as he washed the disciples' feet. And Peter, in John chapter 13, Jesus washed his feet. And when he gets to Peter, verses um, 13, verses 8 through 10, he says, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus answered him. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, That he that is washed, the word washed is as you see there, lao bathed, that's what they have in the King, or in the King James, washed, it actually is, need not to be washed, nipto, two different words in there, right? His feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. In the, the uh, New American Standard Version, it says, Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. Otherwise, he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. So, kind of interesting when you read the different versions there, the wash and the bathe. But the feet speak to our walk, don't they? Back in those days, they had public baths. And so individuals would go to this public bath, they would bathe, and they would, you know, obviously get dressed to go home. They'd put the sandals on their feet, and then they would trudge on home, walking through the streets of Jerusalem or wherever town they were living in. And along the way, they would obviously pick up dirt, and if there was trash along the roads, that might get on their feet. And so when they got home, they'd have to wash their feet. And so when you look at this particular portion of Scripture, our Lord is teaching that when we, when, he, when we came to the cross, we came to Jesus, we are washed all over. We are spiritually cleansed, aren't we? We've asked God to forgive us of our sins. This is the bath, this lao that we talk about, this regeneration. But when we walk through the world, we are defiled and get dirty. And I would, um, we become disobedient and sin gets into our lives. And I don't believe that there's people here that are not probably sinning every week, maybe even every day, consciously or unconsciously in our lives. We do. Every one of us do to some degree. He says that we cannot have fellowship with him if we are dirty. So the washing of the feet, hypto, as we read in that passage, is the cleaning in order to restore us to fellowship. What is uh, Psalms 119.105? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have to allow this word to cleanse us and we have to wash our feet spiritually, if you will. The church service seems, if the church service seems dead or the service seems boring, don't tell me, okay? 
<laughs> it's actually okay, I don't mind, I, I accept criticism. Perhaps it's because we need a bath. We need our spiritual faith to be elevated. First John chapter 116 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We don't want to lie, and if we do, we have to confess that to Christ, don't we? We've got to confess our sins. It is so important to go to him and to tell him our sins than it is because he knows everything about us, right? He knows all the things. He knows the thoughts that we think, even before we think them. But it makes our fellowship so wonderful when we can go to him, when we can ask forgiveness, and we know that he is going to forgive us. Too many times we struggle to be honest with ourselves about sin. If we don't address this sin in our lives, it grows and it, it doesn't just smell bad to God, but sometimes it smells bad to the people that we come in contact with, don't we? How many of you have met people along the way who claim to be Christians, and all of a sudden you do some things that are very questionable? And you think to yourself, that's what a Christian is? And pretty soon that reputation surpasses them, and people know about that. They observe these things, and that's what happens when we don't deal with the sin in our lives and we allow it to permeate us and to become a part of us, we live lives of hypocrisy. Worse than that, man says, I don't want to be like that. If that's what a Christian is, are we perfect? No. We, make, we, we stumble and fall all the time, but we are humbly transparent before the world, aren't we? We let them know that that exact thing, that we're not perfect, not using it as an excuse, but we apologize for our horrible actions sometimes. We go to them and they tell them, hey, I was wrong. And because we can do that, and if we do that, they see sincerity in our lives. They see the Spirit of God working in our lives, and then all of a sudden they change. Well, you know, that person's not so bad. At least they had the strength to apologize, and that takes character. While thinking on this unblemished, because as we talk about these things, and I was thinking about without spot, this perfect sacrifice required, and you see that all the time through the Old Testament. I remember the time when God chided the children of Israel for bringing not so perfect offerings. And I thought, as I was preparing this, I thought about the a title being Imperfect Offerings. And um, in Malachi chapter 1, we're going to read 6 through 14. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of armies to you, the priests who despise my name? But you say, How have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food on my altar. But you say, How have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised, verse 8. And when you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not evil? Or when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not evil? So offer it to your governor. What, would he be pleased with you? Or would he, or he receive you kindly, says the Lord of armies? But now you indeed plead for God's favor so that he will be gracious to us with such an offering on your part. Will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of armies? If only there were one among you who would shut the gates, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar for nothing. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, nor will I offer an offering from your, or accept an offering from your hand. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations, and in every place frankincense is going to be offered to my name. And grain offering that is pure, for my name is, shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it by, by your saying, the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, see how tiresome it is? And you view it as a ritual, says the Lord of armies. And you bring what is taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I accept it from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has, made, who has a male of his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name is feared among the nations. 
It's an interesting portion of scripture, isn't it? You know, we know that God is talking to the nation of Israel at that time, but time has a way of doing things in our lives, doesn't it? You know, when we first get saved, we are all emotional. We are enthusiastic about what God has just done in our lives. But if we don't do the things that we have been saying, and you know, year after year, day after day, read and pray, you begin to lose your faith. You begin to compromise with the world. The late uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee puts it like this. Imagine there is a man living in the hill country of Ephraim, and he has his prized cattle. He always gets the blue ribbon at the uh, cattle shows, but one day his prized bull becomes sick. And when he calls the veterinarian, the veterinarian says, I don't think he's going to make it. I think he's going to die. So the man says, well, let's load him into the truck in a hurry and we'll rush him down to the temple where I'll offer him as a sacrifice. And when the man brings the bull to the temple, the priests see that he is old, it's an old bull and is sick. But they go through it because he is a very prominent fellow and he lives up in Ephraim. Must be a rich area, right? So you see, when the people see the prize blue ribbon being offered, they say, Mr. So-and-so is a generous fellow. Look at what he is offering to the Lord. But the Lord sees that it is blemished. It is not perfect. It is not um, without problems. And that's the attitude that these people had at this particular time. God was telling them that, they, that the offering they offered was really a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read through Malachi and you see that this spotless offering was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were defiling by bringing these horrible offerings, rather than the best, they would bring the worst or the second best to the Lord's table. And it was offensive to God at that particular point. And he told them so as we read through that passage in Malachi. Christ, who was the perfect Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, and any imperfect offering was an insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what they were saying. That's what God was saying through Malachi. And we should recognize that warning sign as a danger signal to God, a red light for us. And this is a message for those who go to church. They listen. They are very conventional, very fundamental in their actions. We raise our hands, clap, stand, sit, do the things we need to do. And yet we say amen. And then we know the language. You've met people like this who say the right things. They can quote a number of scriptures or Christian sayings, and they, uh, but they're satisfied with an immoral morality. They go through a form of truth and all of its beliefs and customs, and yet they are satisfied with that, as if it makes them a Christian, or as, as if it makes them any nearer to God than anyone else in the church. It is merely an outward appearance of what they need to be. They are offering less than perfect to God, aren't they? They actually despise God when they approach him like that. Like the, the publican and the, fair, the sinner, right? God, I thank you. I'm not like that person. That's offensive to God when we don't humbly come before him. Too often, we fit God around our lifestyle and we keep it at a safe distance, not as to interfere with our real life. So whatever we offer to the Lord, it should be the best that we can. He gave us his very best, didn't he? He did. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 1 Peter 1.19 says, But with precious blood, as of the lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And we, because of our association with Christ, because of the atonement that Christ has made for each and every one of us, he says in Ephesians 5.27, that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's what God wants us to be. That was the intent of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross anyway, right? That verse right there that Paul speaks of in Ephesians, that he would present 
this church without spot or wrinkle, each and every one of us, as we humbly come before the Lord and don't offer him second best, but we give him all that we are. We give him the best that we have. And throughout the Bible, you see individuals that were cursed, Cain and Abel, because they didn't give what God had required. People down through the ages have done these things, and Malachi brings it to the nation's attention because they were so far removed from the laws that were taught that they could go on and do these things and think they were getting away with it, but God knows. So what are you giving to God today? It's not about tithing, although that may apply. But what about your life? Are you giving to God honestly the things in your life? Or like the leaders in Malachi's day, what's left over, the lame, the sick, the unblemished, or the blemished, a few dollars in your offering, and not your tithe, one service that you might personally attend at church rather than as soon as the doors are open, only a, a portion of those times, or do we just rationalize in our, in our hearts, I can just stay home and watch on, you know, online one way or the other. Are we giving God our best, or is it, well, i got to get this out of my way. You know, i got to feed my spirit somehow. What I do with that food is a different story. We could throw it up, not let it apply to our lives and walk off, and not make a change in our heart. And that's the whole purpose of a service, isn't it? When we walk into the service, and, I've, and we've said it before, Worship is fine, but the meat and potatoes is the Word of God and getting into our spirit, changing our lives by us acting upon the things that we hear. That's the point of it, so that we can be conformed in the image of Christ. There are people who attend worship services that are not changed at all. They have experienced an emotional time, but they've walked off with the same emptiness in their spirit because they didn't allow the Spirit of God to permeate their soul and, allow, and ask for forgiveness of their sins. So we have to allow the Spirit of God to work in our lives. We like, and you may have seen this, we like to take the best and offer what's left over, don't we? As I was sitting here and, and I was going over some of these thoughts and stuff, I thought, well, yeah, that's kind of interesting. And I think, you know, like sometimes when, uh, it, whether it's at work, it's anywhere probably, it, because we are all of the same, I think. When somebody brings in a big old bag of fruit, what's the first fruits that get taken out of those bags? The best looking. <laughs> and if you're not there first, you're getting scrapings, right? We know that. We've been there. We've seen that. So I was at uh, uh, work one day. And this, this, uh, the secretary that was there, she had a two-pound box of seized candy on the, on the table. And she, she goes, Dave, she goes, would you like a piece of candy? This is before I was really watching that kind of stuff. And I go, sure. So I open up the box, and there was a bite out of every piece of candy in that box. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I don't think they didn't have my flavor in there. <laughs> but we do that. We take the best for our lives. And are we giving God our best? Are you? Am I, are we giving God our best in life, or are we just throwing him scraps? He needs the best. He deserves the best. As we read through Malachi, that he is the great Lord of armies of all the earth. He's the one who saved our soul that we sang about, that, that we worship, and yet we don't give him what he deserves, our very best. Are you serving God when it's convenient or have you given him, and have, or you've given him all, as you said when we first surrendered to him? What do we say? God, I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord and Savior, or some version of that. Are we faithful to that vow we've made? Let's pray. Father, I praise you, and I thank you for this time that we have to come together. Lord, I thank you for your word, and each and every one of us are responsible, Father, for the things that you put in your word so that we might be conformed into the image of your Son, and maybe, Lord, we are not giving you our best. Maybe, Lord, we are not giving you the place of honor you deserve in our life. And Lord, I pray that you would just touch our hearts and forgive us, Father. Forgive us for allowing things to be more important than you, and that's what we're doing. Forgive us, Father, and, and draw us close to you again. We need you, Lord, and we praise you. 
And maybe you're here today and, and uh, you just want some prayer and say, not me, but the words that the word has told us and, and it's maybe spoken to your heart. The spirit has convicted you of something. You just want us to pray for you t today. Can we see your hand and we'll pray for you? See that hand, anyone else? And that hand, anyone else? Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father. I thank you for these who have raised their hands today, Father, and I pray that you would help us to be, to hear what you would have for us today, Father, and that if you're number one in our lives, we would give you what number one deserves, all of us, Lord. Honesty, commitment, truth. God, I praise you. Give us the strength, Lord. Give us the strength, Lord. May your spirit lead us, Father, and, and change us, Father, so that we would be the person that you've called us to be. Allow your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and help us to be obedient to that calling, Lord. I praise you, Father. I thank you, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? We serve a gracious, merciful God, don't we?